Yeah, today we will talk about the role of information in IWM, types of data and how we acquire it, special role of GIS and remote sensing, and modeling. You know, as an uh, overview, of course, uh, each one of these topics is, is rather vast. So as I said, I hope I make the right selection here. Again, we will have one hour for this introductory lecture. Let's start, and this is always, like always, coming back to the same cycle, uh, the same general understanding. Uh, we need to understand the state, then we need to define the goals, uh, then planning, how can we reach the goals? That means uh, planning measures and interventions, and we need to implement them. And during the whole uh, cycle of water resources management, we need a good level of system understanding in order to assess the current state, but also how may the system react to certain interventions, you know? even understanding what is the best goal. I think we need to understand the system well, because only then we can decide what we want to do. Uh, even during implementation, we need certain uh, system knowledge uh, in order to do this is the, the implementation right. And for that, we need methods and tools. But first of all, also, we need information. And information is, I think, uh, yeah, a general term. And we are living in an information age, we sometimes say. We are living in an information, or some people also prefer the term knowledge society. So nowadays, I, I think always, you know, but um, in, in former times, it was perhaps more the acquisition of land, the number of people or the total available labor that was important. You know? So the old discussions, perhaps centuries ago, were more about these key factors, uh, human resources, capital, land, etc., cetera, as the, the, the key resources. Nowadays, uh, it is knowledge that is the key resource. No, we all agree to that, I think. And, and you see also how the world is developing that it's not only the service sector that is growing uh, and much more than any other sector, but it's also the information sector in specific that is growing. Okay, so that's why we uh, focus in this fourth session on that part, uh, how to increase our system understanding and which are methods and tools for that. And this is also a repetition. So I like repetitions when they are emphasizing how important certain things are. Decision making is a collective process. Many stakeholders are involved and all these stakeholders need information. You know? We sometimes like to call it the information cycle that is going basically from a certain way of acquisition of data that is called here monitoring. And you see there are examples of in situ measurement. There are examples of remote sensing. You could have all kinds of forms of acquiring data. And then you are somehow digesting that data. You no know, data analysis. We here call this the modeling, the modeling of real world systems. And then that is leading into uh, decision making, you no know, management and planning. Uh, I also like to refer to this as the three M: you no know, monitoring, modeling, management. And this is, of course, related to our goals. So around the goals of water security, that could be subdivided in other goals. We are trying to, um, yeah, optimize that cycle. And and I think this is also in some of your cases. Uh, like that, that you are not talking about exclusively water security, but perhaps you look at the connection of water security with energy security or with food security. So it is uh, the the I and integrated water resource management is not only related to integration of different aspects within the water cycle, but also integrating from water to other sectors. And that is, as I said, it's connected because it's not starting with monitoring and then ending with decision making. The whole management is actually the the guiding uh, framework for saying yes, we are we need the, uh, certain information, and with that, it is uh, informing the the way we do the monitoring. 
-hmm. So that is, we are not just starting to monitor you know, um, without any kind of clear concept in mind. You know? So the management in a way is, is guiding, is ruling the way we do monitoring. And at the end, it's then converted to information management. Um, this is an example um, how we design that in a project in Bangladesh, where we call it's called web-based agricultural information systems. It's a project on behalf of the government of Bangladesh to optimize the irrigation system, the irrigation sector. And you see, you go from certain sensors, measurements that we have to a certain way of data management that is um, you can also say it's it's a, it's one component of knowledge management that we manage data but then we are analyzing the data with certain thresholds or algorithms we are defining thresholds so these are certain targets that we identify where we say okay this is uh, the limit for soil moisture because uh, this is when the wilting point of plants will start or it's not far away from that so now please irrigate you know and uh, as, a, as a simple example and uh, that is that say converted into different products that could be maps where people see how are things at the moment but in a spatial distributed way we can look at forecasts so what do we expect the next week is it going to rain or not or even in longer time periods and of course all kinds of knowledge products that uh, make decision making easy. So that is just one example of our current work. Another example, it's also from Bangladesh, uh, uh, there where we worked for UNDP. UNDP asked us to develop a portal, climate change information and knowledge management, it's called CCIKM, for the national adaptation plan in, in Bangladesh. So here, uh, no time to to talk about that, but uh, if if you like, you have a link here, and if you go to IKM Information and Knowledge Management, you will see, for example, there are spatial information functions, there are time series functions where you can look at the the current climate in Bangladesh, the past climate, the the predicted climate from the uh, IPCC uh, exercise, etc. But also at vulnerabilities of different sectors and uh, current um, land uses and how they uh, relate to the to the climate change uh, questions. So it should there should be another link uh, with the government of Bangladesh. This is the link to our server. Yeah, that's an example of the role of information. This is now not only water. This is climate change adaptation. But some people say, what is CO two for climate mitigation? Is H two O for adaptation? Uh, and if you talk about adaptation, you will talk 90% about water, actually, you know, because it's we talk about what are the impacts of climate change, climate extremes, our floods, our droughts, our storms, even the uh, to combat the temperature increase. We usually talk about measures to uh, in in the I'm um, just talking about adaptation. No, we talk about measures to increase evapotranspiration, and again, that is part of the water cycle. Yeah, so what can we, what is the information that we can use for IWRM? Uh, how much water is available? Who is entitled to use it? What is the quality of water? What is the flood risk? How much water will be available in the future? So this is the forecasting component. Or also, how much water is the environment getting if we are talking about, or it could be any other specific user. So uh, again, a reminder is then, okay, we need inf a lot of information. Because in order to understand the system, we need to have, understand all its components. So imagine now all these bullet points here are related to certain data sets. You, know, you would really have a hard time to collect all that data. So fortunately, others are doing that for us. So we are, we are you're looking at, let me perhaps uh, finish that. Yeah, in, in a way we are looking at many different sources of information that that are not only useful but even required for IWM, but they come from many different institutions. No, they can come of course from the hydromet services. So this is the I think this is a kind of institution you have in any country, you know, but it could be more specific 
institutions like a flood protection center, an irrigation association, perhaps the hydropower company has very special data on on the river hydrology, on the way they operate reservoirs, that means the release water to the downstream. Or you have uh, certain databases handled by the agricultural services, by the Office of Statistics, of course, anything related to demographics, probably also um, economics. Then you have, if you have a river basin authority, they are managing, again, different parts of data and then if you go down in the in the in the political administrative levels um, you will find that municipalities have a lot of data that depends a bit on the political system here in germany we have municipalities have a very high uh, level of responsibility basically everything we, we call this in our constitution the principle of subsidiarity that means everything that can be done at the local level should be done at the local level. It's not the business of the next higher level. That means the province level or the the national level. No? So that is what we also, some people call this decentralization, uh, but basically it's, uh, it's a, a slightly different term. Subsidiarity means really do it at the local level if you can and take the decision at the local level and, but also have resources available, of course. Uh, that means part of the taxes directly go to the municipalities. Thus, there's also a lot of information available, but that, as I said, is, is maybe different. But in general terms, you have such a picture that many different institutions provide data and they, you can use it for what? Yeah, to make a state of the basin report, for example, no? or any kind of other baseline assessment. You can do a disaster risk assessment, flood risk assessment, drought risk assessment, meaning risk is hazard plus vulnerability. And uh, of course, you, you need a lot of data to combine or information on current water allocation, perhaps also uh, factors related to that. How efficient is water used in different sectors or um, how are you, uh, yeah, how, how, how is uh, allo allocated water related to economic outputs, for example, no? irrigation management. In your research, of course, the same thing. This is why I'm saying it, you may, uh, already be in that process contacting different institutions here and there to get the right data you th you need or you think to need yeah so that is that's a typical situation and uh, if if i have here the symbol of a database uh, sometimes this can this can be very different different no and in <clears throat> some institutions they have the data stored on individual computers. When I did my master thesis, I, or during my master studies, I, I went for an internship to Syria, studying the nitrate pollution uh, issue there, which was quite grave in the in the oasis of Rota in, in Damascus. And then I went to the laboratory and uh, they had only all the measured data on paper. So I, <laughs> I spent most of the time of my internship in digitizing that data, putting the the paper sheet into Excel, no, because they have not done it. They have uh, they have managed the data. I don't know how it is today, but they have managed it in paper form only in the lab. So that is of course then difficult to 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 use that data in a in a subsequent way. No, um, if you have it on Excel sheets, it's in, a, in an individual computer. It's better than nothing. But sometimes you may may have a full fledged databases available. Hopefully they are online. Uh, if they are online, then you can connect them. Uh, so that would be, uh, of course, the desired um, part of it. Now, it is, as I said, it, we could talk now for hours about that topic. It's it's related to uh, the, the, the availability, the transparency of data um, in different countries. Um, it is usually difficult to get access to data. Some institutions, they protect their data. Some institutions sell their data, and this is a business model for them. So that is uh, sometimes a difficult situation. In the United States, uh, you you know, after the Watergate affair, they had the Freedom of Information Act, which was quite useful, especially also for all kinds of environmental applications. So having a law to make access to data and information is is the best thing you can have, because then 
it is not only uh, giving insight to the citizens in different aspects of their own country, uh, but it's also opening ways to to have more analysis. No, in 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 the U.S. since the 1970s, uh, researchers had access to all kinds of databases. Of course, at that time it was not online, no, but it was a it was the obligation to make uh, information available. Also in Europe, we have this, but much more recent, an obligation to share environmental information. So Europe means, yeah, of course, also then Germany. We Most of our laws nowadays are decided in Brussels, not in Berlin. And so it's also good here that you, we typically have access and there are main, there are big efforts in connecting these databases. It's not so, especially also if you think about spatial data, um, you can imagine, no, there are some data is managed by European institutions, national institutions, provincial or municipal institutions. You have specialized agencies managing certain data, like I, like I show here. And if you can connect it, then you, you create, of course, a, a, a whole new level of knowledge you no know? and there's of course it is it's there are technical challenges there are also legal challenges you no know? some data may be related to personal data then in, at least here in germany uh, it is a huge issue or not in germany in europe um, because we need to protect the rights of each individual citizen uh, so there are issues on 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 that you know? so that means yeah we have uh, challenges, but a huge opportunity if we can connect it. So that is what I try to uh, symbolize here with the yellow uh, circle that the databases could be connected. And with that one, you do one research and you can ac have access to all of them. The idea here is really, uh, this is this is what we also call the federated data structures. So federated in the, in the sense that they are independent, but they are connected to one whole, no? to a federation, so to say. Federated data management, that's a keyword that is used. And uh, important is also another term that is called data sovereignty. Uh, sovereign um, means here that each institution keeps to be the uh, the gatekeeper of the data keeps to be the owner of the data. No, you are not by giving access to that data. You are not uh, giving it away like for any kind of use. No, you are still the owner, or the institution is the owner, and the institution can decide um, or needs to be cited. The institution needs to be asked if it's used in any other way than the prescribed way. And um, in some institutions, uh, in some European institutions, they, uh, on some countries in Europe, they also say, yeah, we have to justify that we use our tax money right. So the number of uh, users of our database is such a justification for that. No, so we want to have our, we want to keep our own database. We are not giving all the data away just like that, but even in such a federated data structure, it is possible. No? So there are all kinds of of uh, initiatives. You may have heard about Copernicus, for example, that's an initiative coming originally from the remote sensing sector, but it's also joining other environmental data uh, to a larger project that is called Inspire. That's the infrastructure for spatial data in Europe. So it's a it's one initiative for the whole spatial data of Europe, for example. No? And um, another one that is even bigger is called Gaia X, that is connecting all, uh, creating a framework for all sectors, all data to communicate with each other. No? So these are just examples, but it's it's an important issue, and this is why I'm saying it. Now let's look at data. So what kind of data are we handling? Of course, we have environmental data. This is physical, biological, chemical, classically speaking. You know, we are measuring certain things. That means we are taking samples, bringing them to the lab, analyzing them. We are observing in situ with sensors or perhaps with a, our own observation uh, or, or with remote sensing. You know? And um, that is, that is uh, let's say, um, a large set of environmental data, but also social data that is data related to people. Data related to economy is, of course, another type of data. 
we have we can perhaps um, differentiate quantitative and qualitative data and then the data is there in different uh, formats no just uh, here you have some uh, abbreviations that you may have heard no nowadays in 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 the age of informatics you have also new data formats that didn't exist before like combinations of for example a year day hour second or something like that no so these are then new new data formats that you have or float numbers that could have an endless number of digits behind the 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 digital point etc cetera, etc cetera, or or just um, whole numbers etc so that means now how do we acquire the data where is the data coming from so that is of course again here i show yeah we have the system no we have uh, all these very rough uh, components in our water resource system and we have people etc so but uh, let's just look at some examples no for example uh, if you if you start with a with this uh, figure here you see okay there is um water entering my system that is precipitation as i said it's you can talk about hundreds or thousands of variables describing the system in each component you know and you want to select the perhaps the most relevant ones that you may consider as being indicators for something so you are selecting already from all the potential variables uh, a few you no know? but and i'm here just talking about uh, just a handful you know just to say yeah you can imagine that there is a specific way of observing this kind of variable. For example, precipitation, You, the most simple way is just a kind of uh, bucket, so to say, and you collect rainwater and you read how much is the volume that is that was collected during a day you know, or during a week, whatever you like, or during an, an, an hour, and then you, you you make a reading again no? there are many different forms of gauges uh, the one i show here is the most simple one uh, the one we use for example more is the so-called tipping bucket because then you have a kind of a uh, small bucket that is filling let's say with every five millimeters uh, it is filling and then emptying or when it's full then it's emptying and then it creates a a uh, kind of uh, electronic signal and that makes it then to uh, possible to have an automatic rain gauge no? there are also radar images so radar is basically uh, usually a ground radar that is um, emitting certain radiation um, and if it is reflected then there's a cloud no so that is that gives us a very clear image about the current status of clouds above us and uh, also their density you no know? um, usually then here yeah, the red would be high density that means it is uh, this is a cloud that is raining and uh, others may be less dense you know? and uh, last but not least we have the observation from outside of the atmosphere so radar is typically it's a ground radar and that is also okay that is a way a very, very good way to observe uh, clouds and rainfall and the other would be to observe from space you know, that you are uh, looking at the clouds and you can look um, yeah, at the cloud density with certain measurements. Again, also here we have those that have a radar and here the radar is uh, also emitted by the satellite penetrating the clouds and uh, being reflected uh, to some extent and or not depending on the clouds you know, so that these are variable types of of satellites for precipitation the, the second largest component of the water cycle is the evapotranspiration no? why do i say second largest because precipitation is the largest if you think about a system view how much water enters my system and then looking how much is leaving it um, at the global scale no more or less 60 percent of uh, water entering a certain area I'm talking about the land area no, uh, uh, is is left as evapotranspiration and uh, yeah around 40 percent leaves as runoff that is surface runoff plus groundwater runoff no? and here 
uh, again, there are different ways to observe uh, evapotranspiration on the ground. The evaporation pan is actually only measuring the potential evaporation. Uh, it is filled with water and you measure how much water is leaving the system. No? Um, but the lysimeter can be quite exact because it's measuring the weight of the whole uh, yeah, soil, soil plant water uh, subsystem and with that has a very refined idea about how much water is entering, how much water is leaving as a runoff, that means percolating in this case, and how much water then uh, doing the math is actually leaving as evaporation. More advanced measurement systems are those measuring the energy balance in the atmosphere above the vegetation, so-called eddy covariance towers. And of course, also we have uh, means to measure evapotranspiration by satellites. No, I didn't put it here, but it's it's another alternative. Then we have the runoff. Um, this is the surface runoff. Um, if you have a small creek, you may have such such a V form weir, and uh, according to the to the level where the water is flowing out through that weir, you can um, estimate the the volume, or you have a flume that is bringing the whole flow into a, a more, let's say, uh, yeah, uh, defined profile, and you can have an, a, a bit exacter measurement. If you have a bit larger rivers, you need to do, you need to measure velocity at different points of the river. If it is deeper, also at different depths, and then build the aggregate or the average of the velocity profile, and um, yeah, um, multiply that with the with the diameter, with the wetted diameter or perimeter, and then you can estimate the runoff. There are also ways to measure discharge from satellite data. They are still not so reliable, uh, but it's also possible. Um, and then we have, for example, soil moisture. So here again, we have the classical method is just to take a soil sample uh, of interest and bring it to the lab, uh, dry it, measure the weight before and after, and the difference is the, the water content. But there are also other forms, uh, all kinds of different forms, uh, measuring the, the water, the, the, the soil water potential. So, um, yeah, that is, there, there are also hundreds of different types. There are very cheap ones where you just pay a few dollars per sensor. Uh, but it's also, of course, then it's basically just telling you it's getting wetter or drier, um, or it's wet or it's dry, more or less. And then there are more advanced ones that are giving you the, the exact water content. And they are also more expensive. It depends on what you want to do. Do you want to get the right uh, soil moisture information, or do you just need it to steer an irrigation system? That means, OK, it's getting drier, then let's irrigate. Um, we usually, and uh, let's say also in for soil moisture, there are products available for remote sensing again. No, So I'm uh, already. Uh, referring here to satellite-based monitoring as a growing and more and more and more important alternative to in situ monitoring. It doesn't substitute in situ monitoring, but it's providing additional information and advancing our knowledge uh, significantly. Also for yeah, for soil moisture. Now we could talk about how is that done. What are the different uh, so there are special satellite uh, missions that are measuring soil moisture, for example. Others are good for evapotranspiration. Usually, it's not only the direct measurement of something with satellites, but after that uh, processing of that information, leading to yet another uh, data product, um, often together with either observed data, so you're combining satellite and observed data to form a new data product, or even also with uh, the the results of so-called reanalysis data. That is the data coming from the big global models, global circulation models, for example. They create uh, a quite detailed picture of our Earth uh, related to all kinds of climate and water variables. So that is another uh, very important information source 
for uh, global data products and in combination with the satellite image, ground measurements and reanalysis data, new products are formed and you can access them and download them. So nowadays we have basically for any place on earth, we have at least some information about the most important components of the hydrological cycle or the land cover data, etc. So we also at in our institute, we use a lot of drone technology that is uh, having advantage over satellites that it has a much higher resolution. Satellite information is often coarse in its spatial resolution. Of course, also in its uh, spectral resolution, if you, you have to sell only very selected bands, as we call it, that means only from the whole electromagnetic spectrum, you're only measuring a few selected wavelengths no? that is because it's impossible to have a let's say the whole electromagnetic spectrum to measure everything and in a very high uh, spatial resolution it's not not possible no? in the future it may be possible but that's really a far future now you see also more what we call multi-spectral uh, uh, sessions are uh, sessions um systems are starting and and so there is a, a certain advancement of satellite um, information available here again i have to say thanks to the nasa uh, they started to make landsat information available openly so when they when i did my phd i started my phd i had to ask for the data as, as a researcher you could get it but it was not openly available no? uh, in, in general terms you had to pay for the Landsat data later NASA decided to make, make Landsat data uh, available for free and then the ESA the European Space Agency said okay then we are now starting a new mission the Sentinel mission let us also make it free because otherwise everyone will just use the American uh, products. No? So I, I'm not sure if this is my uh, right estimate, but I think due to the step of NASA making uh, the, the data available, also now more and more other products are available. Usually the satellite uh, missions by China or by India, they are not available JAXA the Japanese uh, mission is also having a lot of products freely available so you can check it uh, but the at the moment the biggest recommendation is to go for perhaps sentinel data it's it's uh, usually it has a higher resolution than the Landsat data but you have to see what is what suits your interest you know? and for your part of the world, there is also a good initiative um, where a lot of Sentinel data is prepared already, and you even have chances to get analyzed data by others. No, it's a, it's 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 a kind of data cube approach where the Sentinel data is available. You can uh, you can play with your algorithms. No, you can change your the uh, you can you can use existing algorithms or you you, you can uh, create your own algorithms, how to deal with that data, and then the product can also be stored in this data cube approach. You can test all that in a kind of sandbox. That's another term that is used to, to try out certain things with your data. And, and this platform is called Digital Earth Africa. So that is, uh, that's something you should look at if you are somehow intending to use satellite data. I think it's a very good um, yeah, a good uh, address, no? Uh, Digital Earth Africa, all written together. And uh, yeah, if you like, I can provide you more information. So this is the huge world of satellites, of uh, but also drones are nowadays becoming quite attractive. Um, we are, or especially students here, they liked drones. No, it's a lot of fun to fly around and take pictures uh, of course not of people again <laughs> prohibited but uh, of uh, of environment and water resources you know? so uh, one colleague here he's working on uh, the aspects of implementing the water framework directive this is uh, about restoration or the ecological status of rivers and the classical way is to walk around a river, a river and to make a protocol and to say okay what do i see what is the 
flora, what is the fauna, what is the meandering, what is the sediment like, what is the riparian zone like. And uh, if you have a drone flying along that river, you can and do that in a fraction of the time available. No. Yeah, okay, so that is, again, I'm sorry, I don't have time to go in detail, but I just wanted to share, okay, this is an example of what we are doing. We have, we call it ITT Smart Sense. So we build our own boxes um, and we can connect sensors to it. So that would be for the in situ part. But I also would like to mention that in situ part can also involve community, you know, for example, doing monitoring with of course professional institutions but just involving schools or even citizen there's this whole area of citizen science nowadays etc no so we also did something on that uh, this is a view of let's say such a box that we built um, again it's a student project basically it's we have student assistants working on that and uh, they are building these boxes with a kind of microcontroller inside and then uh, connections to sensors and you can connect all kinds of sensors you see here again this was also the picture of the soil moisture sensor or wind wind strength wind uh, direction temperature of soil temperature of the air and so on no, of course uh, uh, water level or precipitation uh, there's no let me see, is there a picture of precipitation? Yes, on the right, this one on the right, this is the precipitation sensor, which I said, the tipping box, which is then creating a digital signal, sending it to the box. And from the box, then there's a telemetric unit. Uh, if you have a mobile network, it's transmitted that way, but it, there's also another way that is the, the smart city, uh, let's say favorable, uh, Internet of Thing kind of uh, communication that is called LoRa, no, uh, or LoRa Van. Um, yeah, okay. I think I have to continue, um, but it's an example. And if you want to know more, it's fine. I can I can share that. So after this is the way how we observe. Now it it was just a fraction. If of course you if you observe social data, you have different methods. No, you you either get that from bureaucratic processes or from offices where people are sharing their household information or their company information or their personal information or you do surveys you do interviews with people etc etc no? so these are all sources of information at the end you have uh, you you can use that data and analyze it and uh, it's important to understand that anything we do, anything we observe can be considered as a kind of sampling because uh, you will never have a whole population. You you sample a population. No? The whole population would be to understand the basically each H2O molecule running down the river you know, at any time. That would be the real information. That means any you have a endless number of volume units that you could sample. Um, in in, de in describing the discharge of a river that's not possible no? so we have to select or if you say uh, if you want to optimize your irrigation system you say okay when the soil is getting drier then I should irrigate but of course you know if you look at any agricultural field some plants may be already weak others are still strong uh, because they still have access to to soil moisture so how can you make sure that wherever you place a soil moisture sensor or where you take a grab sample of, of soil moisture or whatever other parameter, no? um, soil, vegetation, water, whatever you measure, you you are just taking a fraction of the total. No? The total population is actually the, the usually the one you're interested in. No? But that means we have to have a representation of that. We have to uh, decide uh, how often do we measure, uh, how, how many samples do I take in a field, if I have a field of let's say one hectare, is one sample enough or should I take four samples or do I need 100 samples in order to get the the idea, or a good representative idea about the, the, the distribution of soil moisture. So that is of course then a question that we can only answer if we have an idea about the variance of this variable. No? That means, or the standard deviation. If we know that, 
exactly, then we can decide on how many samples we need. So it's a kind of, yeah, it's a bit uh, like a hand and egg issue. So if we if we know the statistical distribution, then we can determine on the sampling sites if we, but only we only know about the statistical distribution if we have taken enough samples, no? But anyway, the, um, yeah, we are, we are making a selection that is important, no? So once we have done it, once we have obtained this information, we can apply statistics. For example, I'm deciding to measure the discharge once a day or every hour, and then I have a big, let's say, bulk of data, and I now start to analyze it. You no, know? and uh, depending on the nature of that data, uh, if it is, for example, um, if it is uh, if if it is normally distributed, if the population is normally distributed, then I can apply certain approaches to data analytics. So. I'm not going into statistics here, but just uh, make sure it is very important to have an idea of statistics. And then if it's normally distributed, distributed I can talk about the variance or standard deviation, the median and, and so on. Uh, or I talk about uh, so-called non-parametric statistics if it's not uh, distributed uh, normally. And then I talk about me, uh, then I talk about median, you know, otherwise I talk about mean and 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 so on. No? And yeah, I talk about correlation perhaps. That means I'm observing two variables and they are related one to another. How much are they related? Um, if they are independent, perhaps also more than one, than two variables. I talk about perhaps the distribution of it. I can, um, if it's not normally distributed, I can still show it in box plots. So I, it, it's a good way to summarize how the data is distributed. And of course, yeah, it is all that, even if it's a high correlation, it doesn't say anything about cause and effect. That is, I think, also clear. No? Then a special type of data are time series. So here again, um, we, usually are interested in certain ways like uh, maximum minimum or certain values that are typically reached like uh, discharge as a time series and here we are interested for example what is the uh, the maximum flood that is typically has a recurrence um, level in 100 years or what is the maximum flood in a 20 year period at average and, and so on. No, I'm interested in trends perhaps. So how do I obtain trends in climate science? We need to do homogenization because we usually deal with data coming from a different sources, perhaps each measured in a different way. Perhaps uh, even locations are changed rather than the, even if the environment of a station changes, you can imagine if, uh, if a, temperature station is uh, in a, in nature and over the years it is changed to a built environment of course the temperature is changing not due to the to climate change but to uh, urbanization no so these are things i need to consider and i i do this kind of homogenization and at the end hopefully being able to test for trends and there are certain statistics to it spatial data has other challenges and also this description so spatial data it's typically gridded data but of course spatial data can also be expressed in vector data in gis uh, but um, if i have uh, let's say spatially distributed data i can also interpolate i can interpolate over time i can also interpolate over space and with that create uh, seamless information about uh, any kind of variable and as I said, nowadays, a lot of data sets are available that are um, yeah, summarizing um, different sources of data and they make our life easier. No? So they are free, they are online. So that is, that's perhaps a good alternative. And if you like, and, and perhaps if Bilal is joining, he is managing in our institute, the ITT toolbox, where we also have reference to a lot of open source databases. And some of them may be interesting or relevant for you because what you often find with the observed data is something like that you have gaps so these gaps can be filled either by you let's say interpolation or other forms of 
uh, data filling met methods or, or by combining it uh, or correlating that data with remote sensing data and then filling it with or open data in general and then filling it. Yeah, visualization is very helpful. Sometimes this is now okay. I'm I'm skipping that. Sorry for that. I look at the watch, and I realize we have to uh, advance. Um, this is uh, this is would be a discussion on comparing different open source data sets uh, on precipitation with the names TRMM. Uh, or or it's now the this is the old old um, mission of of NASA for precipitation measurement. It's now called GPM. Um, and then you have yeah, chirps, for example, and so on. And the they are compared in this exercise. And perhaps yeah, looking at an exa another example would be here. Uh, the term water security, which is an index, it's a combination of different indicators. You know? we, we we introduce the term indicator, and uh, if it is very important, we, we we can define the desired level of the indicator at target. For example, for water security, we want to have a, the highest possible amount or, or value of water security. And then we can now have yeah different dimensions of that indicator again different indicators combined are then formed to an index a water security index and here are example how how you could define these sub indicators what could be variables that uh, what could be variables that enter into a water security index at the end and also where are data sources in this case from uh, from from global data sources and at the end, you aggregate that somehow with a decision on weights. Each of the this is the water security index is combined here of four sub indices, and and the author did a, a decision on what is the weight. Um, in in decision making processes, it would not be one author, but it would be a participatory process to do that. And then, uh, yeah. I thought there was a yeah. There's a there's an example. So that is now the the world map of water security according to that previously defined process. Next to remote sensing, which I already mentioned, and you have hundreds of Earth observation satellites out there, all measuring different things uh, in a different spatial resolution, different temporal resolution, different spectral resolution, also having different overfly times, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, uh, that is a huge source of information. But then I would recommend to all of you to become familiar with GIS because that's the tool that we need to analyze the data we obtain, not only from satellites, from any kind of uh, information that has a spatial component. And with that, yeah, I, I recommend actually to use QGIS nowadays, which is an open source GIS. Um, but if you have ArcGIS, it's also, of course, very powerful. You know? And remote sensing can be used for many different applications. Here are just a few, but it also has limitations. I put them in this slide. You can look at it and uh, perhaps, yeah see if if this is also the case for your system now a quick remark on money modeling of course once we have obtained data you can analyze it for example summarize it you can visualize it as as it is you can do statistical analysis you can even start to have a more advanced analysis like understanding correlation between variables but sometimes and if the system is com more complex then this is not enough. And we need to create models, models that are basically uh, helping us to understand more than one relationship uh, between input and output and in between certain elements of our system that are interacting in different ways. And with that, creating a bit a complicated um, yeah, uh, system representation. And we need models, of course, to understand our system, 
perhaps for projections, no, you know, the climate pro projections, these are long-term projections or short-term forecast. Now casting is really from the current state to say what, let's say just by statistical analysis, what is the, the uh, possible future in, in, a, in a near time, but also answering what if questions that help us later to take decisions. No, what happens if we if we change the land use in that way? No, um, but um, this is also a kind of summary. No, um, it's not not perhaps not a nice term, but it's it's quite understandable that uh, you have models that in theory work fine, but if you have basic bad input data, you know, if you're not sure about the quality of your input data, you cannot expect that the output is 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 reliable no so that is this crap in crap out um uh yeah word or or sentence and for sure models are not substituting observation no? so that means uh, models can only use good observation and make more sense out of it and models do not have brain now in the in the age of artificial intelligence that may be debated more and more but uh, it is, let's say, very much, very important that you are checking each model uh, process and each result on your own. In hydrology in particular, but in many other water resources models, we can, we have so-called empirical models that are based on long-term observations and putting a certain number, usually in the, in the, in the center of, of understanding reality. So you have heard about the curve number i introduced that in the first lecture i think when we said okay a certain share of the water is typically running off so that's an empirical knowledge we don't know the physical processes behind it we don't understand really what is happening but we just have this empirical evidence no they are working fine and they are good but it's uh, let's say in terms of understanding the system it is not uh, it, it's it's like say a pragmatic approach, no, to use an empirical model. Conceptual models are in general describing in in a more complex way how things are related one to another. And physical models are using natural laws or you no know, laws of physics or of natural sciences to describe that. And then we can also distribute. We can distinguish um, in the uh, disaggregate aggregation. Of models, we can say lump models that would be for one sub watershed or for my whole study region. I just have one information, it's all lumped or semi distributed. I, I, I divide it into different sub watersheds, for example, or distributed, whatever that means. Of course, it's as I said, there's always a spatial resolution at the at the bottom of it. So that that is then, but it's let's say highly, um, highly distributed in that sense. Okay, sorry, I cannot go to this today. Uh, the the other aspects of modeling, like uh, going from uh, the reality, having a conceptual model, then having a code uh, or the algorithm, then designing the real model and and testing that also in comparison to the uh, to the real world, to the observation. The need for calibration, of course, a model is part of that. Then validation. That means how well does it perform? Uh, in different, you have different criteria to decide that the term sensitivity analysis should be known if you do modeling, the consideration of uncertainties and where can they come from is very important. You know? So make sure that you understand where your model has a high level of certainty, but also where does it have uncertainties and there could be many sources of uncertainty, of course coming from the input data, coming from the lack of knowledge, how things are related, but also from the natural variability, or if it's a decision-making process from unknowns about the decision process in general. And here are some examples of models. So I think now Bilal joined and he can discuss perhaps with you uh, for each part segment of the environment, for each purpose of that you have, there may be other models. And again, this is just a, a small selection. These are models that we have eventually worked with uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the past years, uh, but 
it's just a small fraction of models. But of course, obviously, you have a different model approach if you just talk about optimizing groundwater or surface water or urban water or floods or droughts or water allocation you know, so or, or agricultural water. And uh, yeah, let me uh, stop here because time is advanced. Um, and I actually have another meeting and Bilal is here. So I would say Bilal, uh, you have seen that I rushed through the modeling part in particular. So uh, if you um, if you see there is more interest, um, then please go through the slides again. I perhaps yeah, you, I think you have them, but I can also send them to you. I, I, uh, I have them. I have them. Last. I mean, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. I changed them a bit, but you you still, I think. Okay. You you can, uh, I think, yeah, uh, relay to it again, mm -hmm. and select some of the slides, especially the, yeah, which type of model for which question. No, that is that would be a good entry point for the discussion. So yeah, thank you very much. Sorry for the rush, but uh, as I said, the idea was to give you an overview to have an understanding of what is important, uh, why information is important, that information always is coming from data, data is coming from observations. Uh, and uh, so that is the chain of uh, yeah, uh, the creation of information and later the use of information for decision-making always starts with a concrete observation Observations are difficult to decide because they should be representatives. Observations are costly because they require human resources typically or technical resources investments. So this is a this is often a bottleneck of our whole information chain. Um, but I hope fully created this awareness in this short lecture, and I'm happy to answer more questions in a. Perhaps in another session, if if uh, you are more advanced in your PhD, you may have more questions. But for now, Bilal will be there also to support you in perhaps uh, one or the other way of your decision making regarding the data. Sorry, I have another meeting now. And for that, I say goodbye. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rennie and all the team at NUST to invite us for this blog course and I hope you you enjoy. Colleagues, thank you so much. Can we give um, Prof. Las Ribe, uh, Bilal and Mina a, a round of applause? You know, your online hands will be much appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, yeah. Actually, it's not over, so I'm I'm leaving. But uh, Bilal is still here, and uh, yeah, if you, as I said, any kind of uh, feedback is welcome. So we want to um, always improve and and see uh, how can we best do it. Of course, in the in the ideal sense, in a, eventually uh, we could meet in person. No, that is that means a completely different thing because if you are meeting in person, you can really have a dialogue. In a in a in the in the central way, you know, in the way that I I think it is most efficient. You know? But we for the time being, we are. When they do make uh, their trip for the mobility in Germany, mm -hmm. they will have the honor of meeting you in person. Unfortunately, the secretariat will remain in Namibia during that week. <laughs> but we are hoping yeah. the three months mobility, some of um, our students will have an opportunity to come to your center and engage with you and your research groups and to 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 to, to learn and interact with you in a in a um one on one um platforms if 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 ever it happens but really we quite appreciate uh, i was saying to monday having done masters in IWM, we still find the sessions quite insightful. You know, it's taking us back 10 years ago when we actually master students. So thank you so much and more so for providing links where information can be found, resources that the students can actually um, draw um, and make use of for their PhD work. 
We quite appreciate the support that has been extended to our students and our research community at large. Thank you so much. So Bilal and Mina, I will hand yeah. over to, to, to you to continue with the session. I don't know if you want a break in between uh, uh, yes. or whether you just want to continue. Uh, we can take five minutes break and then okay. continue with what Bilal has prepared for today. Thank you so much. Okay, five minutes it is. Yes, see you in five oh, minutes. We meet, meet at 10.15. Indeed, thank you. Welcome. Ja, ich bin, ich kann euch hören, sehr gut. Achso, dann lege ich jetzt einfach die Trauschweiter. Ich weiß auch nicht, ob das funktioniert. Sag mal was, dann musst du sagen, Udo, ob du was hören kannst. Um, Lars, I think you're muted, but we're taking five minutes break before continuing with the exercise. Okay. <laughs> 